Say hello, I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, May 11th, day before Mother's Day. That's why we're playing Murray Porter's song, Mom is a Three-Letter Word, uh, as opposed to the four-letter words. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I wanted to give a shout-out to uh, to mothers, uh, you know, coming on Mother's Day, uh, coming up on Mother's Day. Um, you know, I oftentimes, when I when I do a shout-out to, the, to the, the mothers, I also do a bit of a call-out to the... Uh, to the fathers who don't step up, especially those who leave single mothers raising children and and trying to uh, you know uh, fulfill the responsibility that men that men fail to respond to and um, uh, you know when we talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women you know there's there's a there's violence that uh, that takes place physical and then there's emotional violence and and I oftentimes uh, am, am really concerned about what so many men have chosen to put women through in terms of uh, uh, leaving them to raise children on their own and that kind of thing. So, uh, again, my shout-out to, to mothers on Mother's Day. Um, I also, before I even start the show, I have, I've mean, got to apologize first uh, to my granddaughters, Julia and, and Rayel, because um, on the 7th, when I did a show, I did not mention that their birthday was coming up the next day. So I am wishing both Julia Rose and Rayel Skye, my two granddaughters, um, uh, a happy uh, 10th year uh, birthday. Uh, in fact, today we celebrated Rail's birthday party, and last weekend we celebrated uh, Julia's. But they're both born on, this, on May 8th. And uh, I have a unique situation where I had two of my daughters um, who were giving, who gave birth to, to little girls on the exact same day. Not just the same calendar day. I mean, the same day. I had to rush from one hospital to another. Those of you who know me know the story, but uh, those who don't really know uh, my personal life that much, uh, um, I do have two. I, I have two granddaughters that are born on the same day, uh, sixty miles apart, two separate hospitals, and uh, today the they, uh, uh, well, this week they turned ten. So uh, happy birthday to to Julia and Rael, my uh, my my two oldest granddaughters. So got that. All right, now let me get get started. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment. Uh, we do encourage, and in some cases, start a conversation. Uh, we don't do prayers or Buffalo speeches. We do shout outs. Uh, we take a tough look at history, oppression, survival. Uh, we talk about uh, culture, arts, politics, identity, and we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to break down what separates us and bring us together in doing so. Uh, we'll take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us, and there is plenty. And we do it all live right here from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation. Uh, so let's talk native. But before I do that, let me uh, remind people that this show streams live on Facebook Live. This show um, uh, streams on our, our website. Uh, the audio uh, streams on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. And I encourage you to go to the website. We, you can watch our live streams from there. You can uh, you know, catch our podcasts from there. We have galleries. We've got a lot of information including information if somebody wants to uh, contact me for do a to do a speaking engagement or, or any number of things. Go to our website, again, www.letstalknative.com. Our videos are there, our audio are there, and links to uh, a bunch of the podcast platforms if you're not familiar with them. Uh, our shows do get put up as podcasts immediately after we air, and we take the video from our Facebook live stream and we post it up on uh, our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. I am the host of Let's Talk Native, and I'm a, I, I am assisted by Jake Proud here in studio, who is managing our, our video and our sound. All right. So I, I, one of the things that, uh, that becomes real uh, apparent to me as we are challenged with everything from, you know, the extractive industries violating our territories and coming into our territories to, you know, endangering our water, our air, our land, all that stuff. Um, and even as we battle the state or the federal government on, over tax issues or our, our, our right to do commerce and, and, and so many things, the gaming issue that the Senecas are facing, all of this stuff, it's important that we realize that we have to fight these things. We have to fight for ourselves. And, and we should not just base our fight on our likelihood of winning this fight in, in a specific courtroom or in a specific venue. Sometimes the fight is the thing. And, and I know that sounds, uh, maybe that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Now, and look, and I'm not saying that we fight um, at all costs. I mean, I'm not suggesting that people, that we need to kill people or we need to have our, our people in prison for, you know, for, you know, tremendously long sentences. 
look, I've been to prison. It's it's not a picnic, but it's not the end of the world either. Some things are worth fighting for. You know, and I'll tell you, when I went through my legal challenges, I did not accept a plea agreement. I did not bargain my way down. I did not plead guilty to anything. I took I took my case to uh, to trial, federal court. I I took the stand in my own defense. I had a crappy uh, attorney. Eh, we always do, right? Um, but I can sit here today and say with pride that I did that I didn't give in and I didn't I didn't surrender. I didn't um, you know look. I even fought it. I even appealed to, uh, Bill Kunstler, William Kunstler, the famous William Kunstler. He actually uh, did my appeal. Appealed uh, my case based on jurisdictional issues, and you know, what, what, and and it's important to do this stuff, and and that's the, I guess my point, because here's what we we hear from from attorneys all the time. We hear them always tell us, "Well, you're not going to win fighting it that way." So whether we're talking about taxes, whether we're trying to stop a pipeline, whether we're trying to fight the uh, the state government, the federal government, on anything, we hear it all the time. We hear the attorney say, "Oh, you're not going to win. You're not going to win a land claim. You're not going to win a tax uh, case." Look, for one thing. If that's your opinion, I'm not sure I want you defending me anyway. But even if that's your opinion, that's not the opinion I'm asking for. I'm not asking you if I can win. I'm telling you as the guy who's employing you that I want to fight this thing. So I'm when I'm expecting you to do, native or non-native, because, uh, look, we hear this crap from, uh, from native attorneys too. What I want them to hear them say is let's put up the best, uh, the best fight we can based on the position that you want to take. I don't want to hear somebody say, well, you know, you're never going to beat, uh, uh, beat a tax charge because you're already bought into the whole system. You already you've bought into their, uh, you know, their, again, their, their sense of uh, precedent setting cases that you say are all stacked up against us. And there's a reason they're stacked up against us, because every time we put up a, a solid argument, they'll just dismiss the case. So nothing ever gets set up as a precedent. We don't get to change the foundation of law. And instead, they keep building more and more of a foundation on a false premise. I'm not the first person to tell you this, and I, this is the first time I tell you. A lot of the, the cases that uh, are of the authority that the, the United States wields against us comes from racist church dogma from the 15th century, the doctrine of Christian discovery. And we can, the, the line of succession on when this becomes codified into U.S. law and then comes all the way up to the current you know, the current time today, contemporary time. I mean, it, it's it's clear what, what they've built it upon. And the fact is that there's a there's an inherent racism in their in their in their court system that that we are beneath them that often look, they've even ruled sometimes that in our favor. And they've said, look, when there's a, when there's a situation where there's ambiguity in the law, we've got to rule on the side of, of native people because because they're less competent than we are. Literally. I mean, there, there's case after case after case, ruling after ruling, where courts have ruled in our favor and said, well, we have to rule in their favor because uh, you, we, can't ex- we can't expect Native people to have the same level of competence in this legal system as, um, as prosecutors, as legislators. And if legislators haven't done a clear enough job in, in the laws they pass, or in treaties for that matter, if treaties are ambiguous, Courts have said, "Well, we got, we got a rule," and and that even even that is a condescending attitude that they have. I look, I'm not saying that they they shouldn't construe their rulings based on our perception of of what is written. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but the fact that it's based on the fact that they think that we're incompetent or somehow disabled, <laughs> I mean, is um, this is what uh, what what the law is based on, and this is why we have to challenge it. And look, if we if we lose in their court case. Then, then we're no worse off, right? I mean, because they were going, to, they were going to rule against us anyway, right? But the whole point is, every time we make a solid argument, and they have to rely on something absurd or wrong, if they have to make a bad ruling just to be consistent with their law, there's there's a value that comes from that. And, and, and hear me out on that. I know it sounds terrible to say that a, you know a bad ruling is a good thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying there's value in the the prosecutor or the United States or the state or whoever we're fighting against, if they have to rely on something really weak to win their case against us, look, the deck's stacked against us anyway. But let's make them say the foolish things. Let when, So when Ruth Bader Ginsburg in 2005, which is pretty contem- contemporary, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a Jewish woman, 
a Jewish woman, a liberal court justice, you know, the liberal darling of the Supreme Court, right? If she has to cite in her footnotes, the footnote number one, I might add, the doctrine of Christian discovery, and then and then explain it. That, that and and as she explains it, she does. I mean, it's not a very good explanation either. She just says, "Title to the land became uh, uh, became vested in the sovereigns." First, the discovering uh, 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 the, the discovering European nations, then the states, and, the, and and ultimately the United States. That's what she says. That's what her interpretation. So she doesn't say how it becomes vested, but that it's the and and because she says it becomes vested in the sovereigns. What she's saying is that we weren't, that we weren't sovereign. That only white people could could claim to have sovereignty because you know actually by definition sovereignty is something that in their belief system is associated with their the religious beliefs that God somehow bestowed them with, with, with authority over people. So, but, but if Ruth Bader Ginsburg, again, it's the doctrine of Christian discovery, just because they leave the word Christian out, doesn't change where it comes from. It comes from church dogma. It comes from the Vatican. And the idea that a Jewish woman is going to cite this church doctrine as part of the basis for her ruling. There's a whole level of, of absurdity associated with that, you know, and keep in mind, she cites that in 2005, and there's been already been negotiations at, at the United Nations to um, uh, to pass this Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where they condemn the doctrine of Christian discovery, almost almost by name. I mean, and and I know I read this all the time, so I'm going to read it one more time, just because if you understand that the doctrine of Christian discovery is basically saying that the Christian nations of Europe could claim title to the land because they were Christians. And they could claim it from anybody who, was, who didn't believe what they believed. It is based on this uh, sense of superiority. You know, white supremacy for all intents and purposes. But uh, again, so here's the third affirmation of the UN Declaration that was passed only a couple of years, um, 2007. Ginsburg cites the Doctrine of Discovery in her, uh, in her case against the Oneidas in 2005. And in 2007, this becomes universally accepted. Well, with the exception of the four countries who voted against it, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. But but here's the here's the preamble. Here's one of the the you know the the affirmations in the preamble. Preamble. Uh, affirming further that all doctrines, policies, and practices based on or advocating superiority of peoples or individuals on the basis of national origin, European countries, uh, uh, racial, religious, ethnic, or cultural differences are racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable. And socially unjust. So the United Nations, two years after Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg cites the Doctrine of Discovery, basically says it's, le it's legally invalid. Now, did that change the, the ruling? No, it doesn't. But the point that I'm trying to make is if we back them into a corner and they have to make these absurd rulings, if they have to make bad rulings because it's the only way they can rule in their favor— Look, it, it's not a stretch for me to bring this right forward to what the Senecas are going through with this arbitration panel, which is still a bunch of white guys. I mean, look, uh, even even Kevin Washburn, who is who is in Chickasaw, he's pretty much you know in that system. So arbitration is not a whole lot different than court. And you got two white guys and and and, and Kevin Washburn at Chickasaw who are ruling on this stuff, and the two white guys basically have to rewrite the compact to rule in favor of the state. I mean, this is, it's an absurd ruling. So even though it's a bad ruling, we need to e expose it for what it is, because this is one of the things that, that everybody should know that when the state tries to make the case in front of an arbitration panel, that, uh, the, the intent of the compact or is it's presumed, um, that the, the uh, revenue sharing payments will continue through the renewal period is based on pulling it from thin air. And in fact, the, the state never produced a single witness from the state that was the party to the, uh, to the uh, negotiating the compact in the first place. Okay. In case that doesn't make sense. It isn't just the state versus the Seneca nation. We have a completely different party representing the state in 2002 when the, when the uh, compact was, was negotiated. Not only a completely different party in terms of administration, but a co completely different political party. George Pataki was a Republican. It was a Republican administration that, that negotiated the, the compact in 2002. So when 
Andrew Cuomo is saying, well, our interpretation is this. He's never even saying, well, well what was the Pataki's uh, administration's uh, intent or, in- or interpretation of what they negotiated? And if they did negotiate, if it was their intent, that the that payments should continue past the 14-year period that was laid out in the compact, then why didn't they properly articulate uh, the, the, the payments continuing? Why did they not do it? So that's one question. The other question is, you, Andrew Cuomo, in the run-up to renewal of this thing, why didn't you re-articulate? Why didn't you utilize the process laid out in the renewal uh, plan to say, look, there's some language here that we need to fix? You didn't do it either. So you have two separate administrations representing New York State, two separate entities representing New York State over a decade apart, one in, in the run-up to 2002 and one, and one in the run-up uh, currently. And the assumption that these two white men on, on the arbitration panel are saying is that, um, oh, it was just a mistake, that two separate bodies of, uh, of, of lawyers, banks of lawyers representing two different administrations could make the same mistake twice? While the Senecas are just relying on the on the actual language that's there, that's an absurd ruling. So now, how does how does that have any value? It has no value if we don't call it out. If we don't call out Ruth Bader Ginsburg for citing, not just citing the doctrine of Christian discovery in, in, in the case against Oneida, but further calling out the rest of the bad part of a ruling. See, we need to do this on every occasion. And and again, I don't think it's a mistake. Even though I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of the United Nations and the fact that they seem so impotent, the fact of the matter is that it is a forum. And we don't have enough people going in. I mean, we got Orrin Lyons and we got you know, different ones that will step up to the podium at the United Nations. But we don't have people standing up and saying, look, the United States is standing in stark violation of the U.N. Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I, it's a non-binding agreement. We understand that. But let's call it out for what it is. Let's shine a light on it. And we can, we can you know, cite not only you know, uh, the liberal darling of the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but we can cite the governor of the state of New York. We can cite uh, you know, who's a Democrat. We can cite uh, the, uh, the mayor of Niagara Falls. We can cite you know, a ton of things from, uh, that Donald Trump is doing on a daily basis. So my point is whether we win or not in these battles, including taxes, I mean, look, if, if the IRS is trying to nail us for several million dollars worth of taxes and we say, hell no, and we make our argument, one thing, our first battle is with our own, with our own attorneys, first off, because we've got to convince our attorneys that we're right, that we believe we're right, even if the attorney doesn't believe so. And I'll tell you, that starts to, starts to show itself. You can, you can tell when an attorney is not making an argument they, that they believe in. And that's part of the problem. We don't have attorneys, um, native or non-native, who are willing to go to the mat on this stuff and say, look, the United States has no legal basis for claiming uh, the right to tax uh, native people. I mean, think, think about this. And I've said this before, but think about this for a second. Think about a guy who gets elected to, say, the Seneca Nation Council or, or the Seneca Nation president. President of the Seneca Nation gets elected. How absurd is it that a, that a Seneca on Seneca territory, living, working, and his job is for the Seneca Nation, how is it the federal government can claim 25, 30, th- you know, I don't know what the percentage is. I, I, don't, I don't pay federal taxes, so, but they're claiming at least 25% of that income. How the hell can the federal government claim 25 to 30 percent of the income of a guy who's serving his nation that is not the United States. I mean, that's that's absurd to me. I mean, that would be like, look, the analogy is clear. It'd it'd be like the United States saying, you know, um, that Justin Trudeau, we're going to tax We're going to tax his income as the prime minister of Canada because what he comes there. I don't know because he lives close. I don't I don't know. But you see, this is the, but nobody fights it. We don't have anybody in the Senate Nation. We don't have anybody in Aquasasne fighting this, you know, on a tribal council. We don't have, even the, not the Anadagas, not the Tonawandas. Nobody's fighting this thing. And in fact, as soon as the IRS starts banging on their doors, they, they, they almost close up shop. Onondaga, they were ma- manufacturing cigarettes at one, at one point. When the Treasury Department came ba- back on, the, they stopped. They just stopped. They didn't fight it. 
And, and you know what? They're, and they're being pressed by the IRS. And you think if they were fighting the IRS, wouldn't they want to publicize that to the rest of us? But instead, everybody makes their deal. Oh, well, 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 we'll negotiate the number down. There is no reason in the world that anybody who lives on Native territory is paying federal income tax. I mean, we're not paying state tax, uh, you know, state, state income tax. But we shouldn't be paying federal income tax either. But how does anybody make the argument if the guys who are, who are serving in, in an official capacity for the Seneca Nation are allow, is allowing the federal government to take money from them, 25 30 35% of their, of their income? I mean, it's that much. Because let's face it, if you're, if you're elected as a, on council or the president of the Seneca Nation, you're making a pretty good buck. You're making over 100 grand. The chances are you're paying over 25% of your, your income to the federal government. To the, to the United States government, you're letting another government take money away from you for the service that you're performing for your own people. I mean, how do we not fight this? And, and again, we can make a compelling argument because when did we ever concede to this? When, when, where is that free prior and informed consent that is laid out not only in this, but where, I mean, the United States, what they, that's what they said in their, in their Declaration of Independence. That... Uh, that just powers of a government come from the consent of the governed. That's what it says in the Declaration. Their foundational document, where they're asserting independence from from Great Britain, they they claim that there, that a, a true government, a truly just government, gets its power from the consent of the governed. Well, when did we consent? When did we give them that power? I mean, when they passed the 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 legislation that created the um, income tax. They didn't even they didn't even have us on the books as their as their citizens. I'm not saying we are even today we aren't, I would argue, but that would pass in, in 1913. In 1924, they would try to pass an act that said, well, we can be US citizens. But keep this in mind, even though that tax the, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service or the, the federal income tax was created in 1913, in 1924, when the United States did pass the Indian Citizenship Act, the language on there not only declares that we're all citizens you know, whether we agree to it or not, but there's a, there's a provided part. This is provide it. That's provided. Nothing in this law shall interfere uh, with, with the, with the property trial or otherwise uh, personal property. Well, how is our income? How is the, the money that we, we get for our labor, not our personal property. So even the Indian citizenship act, which I reject by the way, doesn't allow them to, uh, to tax us. So when the federal government tries to say, well, we have, a, we have the sense that when we pass a law, it's generally um, applicable to everybody, including Native people. Well, wait a second. If you don't stipulate that, well, this is the stuff that we have to continue to argue. And we don't. We don't. And, and the few people who do, and, and there's been plenty of people who've, who fought the IRS and had their cases thrown out. But they don't win. They don't because because the federal courts won't allow us to win. They'd rather dismiss the case than than rule in our favor. So so where's the the uh, the nation that's going to fight it? When's the Seneca Nation going to do it? Are they ever going to do it? I don't know. Nobody's done it yet. I got to take my hat my hat off to Yakima because at least they fought um, in in a big way against the taxation that the state of Washington was trying to in, uh, impose against them as it related to them. Conducting commerce, them trying to do native to native trade, them putting their products on the road to other territories. The state of Washington says, "Well, we can tax you for that. You know, you don't you don't have the right to use our highways. We can tax you like we tax anybody else." Well, I'll tell you, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Yakima even even argued some of the terms of the doctrine of Christian discovery. They threw that in their in their, in their argument, and you know what? The Yakima prevailed. They prevailed not only um, by with the liberal court justice, but but even the the Republican nominated guy, this uh, Neil Gorsuch. He he joined Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her uh, in writing the opinion that uh, that supported the, the Yakima's claim that they don't have to pay taxes because because their treaties protected their right to uh, to do business. See, and and while I think that's a good ruling, I still find that even some of that problematic because when they say. Unless we have a treaty that gave us a right that we don't have the right, no, 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 that's wrong. 
unless you have a treaty where we surrendered the right, then the assumption has to be that we have it. So if you say, well, there's nobody, there was nothing, nothing ever said you could make cigarettes. Yeah, but there's nothing ever said we couldn't. I mean, to say that, that we can only do the things that, were, that we accounted for in a, in a specific document, no. When you pass a law that tries to infringe upon our rights, unless you can specifically stipulate that, that we have consented to this subjugation, then how do you say that it exists? How can you say that we consented? I got more on this, so so don't go away, folks. We're at the bottom of the hour. We're going to take a break here, and we'll come back. Uh, I want to get into – see, we have to flesh these guys out. We, we have to put their own meat on their own bones so we can call them out for what they are. And I've got a few few names, uh, some that might surprise you, that I want to call out. We, we'll do that when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Thanks for coming back. Hey, let me uh, thank our sponsors first off. I want to thank uh, Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses, uh, Eric White and ERW Enterprises. And I've got another sponsor out there who uh, chooses to remain anonymous. Um, but uh, I, I really appreciate those of you, um, especially those three, that, uh, that provide funding on a regular basis, whether it's weekly or monthly. Uh, that allows us to do what we're doing. And we're adding some features here. We're trying to, uh, we got a new video coming out uh, this week. You'll see us trying some new things as we, even as we produce those, uh, those things. Um, so we're, we're trying to add and, and trying to improve the product that we're delivering here uh, as we go. Uh, and we can only do that with the support of, of people. And, you know, there's a few people who from time to time will, uh, will provide, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred dollars there. And, and it makes a difference. I mean, um, all of all the help that we get enables us to do more. And 
and we're only limited by by the resources that we have. That's the that's our own only limitation. You know, I, I've I've talked about that that I designed. I don't have it uh, here in my back my backdrop in place, but I, I I designed a a flag for missing and murdered Indigenous women. I I, I guess I should put that banner up. <laughs> um, and I and I want to produce a flag, and 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 I haven't had the resources to do it. And you know, it's kind of expensive to to get flags printed, but uh, I'm going to do it. I'm I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to start getting them out there so people. If you follow me on Facebook, you saw my post. You saw that M M I W flag uh, with the you know the the white silhouette representing the missing and the chalk line representing the uh, you know the murdered women. Um, it's it's an image that I'm very proud of, but I, I haven't been able to get it out there. Again, limited by what by the resource that we have. Um, but I will say, beyond those who, who support the program financially, there are many of you that support the program by allowing us to to share our um, our Facebook live stream on your on your pages. Uh, my wife shares uh, shares that on a bunch of pages. I share it on a bunch of pages. And the fact that you let us do that that supports what we do. The fact that many of you you share the show, you share the podcast, you share the 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 um the youtube video you you spread the word and you engage you 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 offer your comments you uh you participate in the conversation that's what we're trying to do here so what i'm talking about here today is the fact that we have to fight not because not even because we can win but because we have to fight i mean we have to oppose these pipelines you know look i'm not going to say just because the dakota access pipeline was completed that it was a futile effort to stop it. No, we, we gained a lot of attention. We, there, there were some things accomplished there. I mean, we, did, we, did we accomplish our, our ultimate goal? Maybe not. But I mean, think about this. I mean, because one of the things that, that, that really bugs me, when I talk about um, shining a light on, on what they do, their practices, we, look, one of their, one of their guys uh, got busted trying to bring a, uh, bring a rifle in. Uh, and and it, w- it was from the, uh, again, the opposition. We had a native guy, uh, undercover informant for the FBI, not only sleep with one of the one of the activist women, but gave him gave her his gun. The fact that Red Fawn is in uh, is in jail for uh, over over a, a gun discharging, that's not the story. The story is that the gun came from an FBI informant, a native guy, and so we got to call these people out. We have to call all of these people out. We we gotta expose what what our enemies are, who they are, what they are, and and look. Sometimes those enemies look just like us. They're not just you know uh, they're not just an FBI informant. Sometimes they're they're a tribal counselor. They're a chairman. These are the guys who who oftentimes are our enemies. That's what I talked about with the Sogoyeta uh, last week. We have to acknowledge who the enemy is. And when I say enemy, I don't mean death blow enemy people that we need to kill i'm not talking about that but we have enemies that we need to confront and and many of them like i said we have a lot of iconic native faces and voices that are out there that when push come to shove they'll call us down for fighting they'll say no you, you have to use their system i mean look even when you got, got people like suzanne harjo and Oren Lyons telling us oh we have to vote in their elections I mean, I come back to that same place and I say, look, we want to talk decolonization. Decolonization is not about finding a comfortable place within their oppressive systems. It's about untangling and stripping ourselves away from those systems. I don't care about destroying their systems or dismantling the systems in total. I'm saying just keep them off of me. Just keep your systems away from me. So when I hear some of our own people telling us, oh, no, that's the way we have to fight them. We, we got to. We got to run in their elections. We got to vote in their elections. We got to serve in their military. We've got to become cops. We got to become FBI agents. No, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, look, people are going to do what they're going to do, but I say we got to call this this out. You know, and you know, so when I talk about like Ruth Bader Ginsburg citing the doctrine of Christian discovery in a case against the Oneidas, there, I mean, there's a level of absurdity to that. That if we don't continue to pound on that, I mean, think about this. A few years ago, John McCain and Jeff Flake, senators from Arizona, and 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 uh, and a Republican and a Democratic congressman from Arizona, were pitching this idea of attaching to a defense authorization spending bill this idea that they would um, lease out ancestral Apache land 
for copper mining to a, to a foreign country. And when the Apache protested and, and called out, you know, Paul Gozer, and I hope I'm saying his name right. Actually, I don't care if I'm saying his name right. But anyway, Paul Gozer, G-O-S-A-R, who is a Republican congressman from Arizona, he literally said, well, you're just wards of the federal government. Now, that is an extremely offensive thing for him to say. It is, but that's the view that they have. And you know what? <laughs> we have a lot of Native people who think that we're wards of the federal government, too. And when we say wards of the state, we don't mean the, the, the states of the United States. We mean the nation state of the United States. This notion that Native people are wards and that the United States is our, our, our custodians, that's been a widely held belief. That, that goes, again, goes back to Johnson, not just Johnson v. McIntosh, but the, um, the chief justice at the time, John Marshall, he, he's responsible for what's called a trilogy of, tr- of cases. Um, one of them is Johnson v. McIntosh. The other is um, uh, uh, Cherokee versus the state of Georgia. And the other is uh, Worcester or, or Worcester. Or I, don't know, I don't remember the other, the other case. But um, <clears throat> this is, it, it was in Cherokee versus Georgia that John Marshall started saying, oh, that we were like dependent, domestic dependent nations. That, we, that our relationship to, to the United States was, was that of that like a ward to a custodian. And so this notion that we were like incompetent, you know, is, is born out of this is this is again, white man with a black robe, basically saying that we're ignorant, that we're incompetent, we're immature. We, we don't have the competency to to manage our own affairs. And that's why we that's why they, why they can assert control over our territory. And there's still a lot of, so when, when Paul Gozer says this, and this is only a couple of years ago, I mean, literally just a couple of years ago, says, well, you're just wards of the federal government. Wow. I mean, we know that that's, that's, the, that's the view that they have, but when they actually say it, when they actually say it, it's important, folks. It's important because we got to keep calling out. And let's not call out the fact just that he says it, we should call out every one of those politicians. I mean, because I'll tell you, if we tell a state or federal representative that we're that we're not citizens of the United States, they they just they just kind of dismiss. It. Oh, oh yeah, you are. You can't claim you're not a citizen. They literally will say to a to a native person, "Oh, you're you're a U.S. citizen," even if we tell them that. I mean, that's how dismissive, how condescending, and again. This is this is white supremacy showing itself. So when you tell somebody, no, I'm I'm Mohawk or I'm I'm Gunyagahaga, I'm I'm uh Onondawaga, I'm I'm not I'm not a US citizen. I'm native, I live on my own lands, I, I am you know, I have a native government that is responsible for for where I live, and it's not you. I depend on you for nothing. And yet they'll say, Oh yeah, but yeah, but 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 you're 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 still you're still US citizen. So that's how, I mean, that's the way their brains think. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Native people who think that way too. But that's why we have to step up. And we have to fight. We've got to fight the income tax. We've got to fight sales tax. We've got to fight excise tax. We've got to fight all of this stuff. And I'm not saying every one of us have to, has to fight every fight. But every one of us has an area that we could dedicate a certain amount of time, whether it's the mascot issue you know, whether it's, um, uh, again, environmental issues, whether it's, you know, them putting pipelines through our territories, whether, whether it's stepping up and, and being vocal on, look, on, on this, I, I'm really disappointed that there aren't more Senecas raising hell over the fact that the, that the state government is trying to screw them out of a billion dollars. I mean, I don't know if people aren't wrapping their heads around this thing. The state is trying to squeeze the Senecas. They already got them for a billion and a half, billion four. And they're going to try to squeeze them for another billion dollars through 2023. And I'll tell you, there's a certain sentiment that exists, certainly within the, the, the lawyers representing the Seneca Nation, but there's a certain sentiment that exists with some of the, um, uh, the elected officials that say, well, you know, worst case scenario, you know, we just pay it. And then we'll, we'll try to fight it in 2023 when we renew again. Wait a second, that's a billion dollars that you're you're conceding to. It's 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 like 30 million dollars every quarter. I mean, 
look at your population, folks. Look, Senecas, look at your population. 8,000 of you, maybe. And $30 million a quarter, you're giving it to the state because you are giving it to them. So th- that's, so I, I, again, I don't want to harp on it, but, well, yeah, I do. I do harp on it, but, but this is one of those things. How do we not fight for this stuff? I mean, look, it's, it's great to go fight about, you know, down in Cottersport about them putting, you know, uh, uh, fracking wastewater in the headwaters of the Allegheny River. I agree with that fight. But if you could become passionate about that and not be passionate about the fact that New York State is trying to screw you out of a billion dollars or that not only are you being taxed by the federal government, but even Senecas who are only working in and for the Seneca Nation are having 25 to 30 percent of their their income taken away by the federal government. I mean – these, there's a reason for fighting these issues. And the reason for fighting, fighting it isn't just because we can topple them. Isn't just because we're going to win. But I will say, we will win eventually. Eventually, these absurd rulings. You know, a ruling like, you know, like this, um, uh, this arbitration panel against the Senecas. It's, it's a bad ruling. At very least... And, and I again, I hate to say this as a concession. At very least, there's no freaking way the Senecas will continue to pay at, past 2023. I mean, there's no way they should pay now. And, and there's no way they should pay this billion dollars between now through 2023. But at least the absurdity of what the state has demanded, what this arbitration system has, has imposed upon them, demonstrates how, how much the state, and the federal government. Because if the federal government doesn't step up, if the Interior Department doesn't step up the way they're supposed to in in the oversight of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, then it is clear that their intent is to screw us. Which is kind of clear anyway. But we need to call it all out. So we need to tell the entire world, do you know that the Jewish lady on the court cited the Doctrine of Christian Discovery? Over a case where Native people bought the land back for them for themselves? I mean, how absurd is that? I mean, these are the kinds of conversations we need to expose just how absurd it is. The you know, this uh, this sense of entitlement that the federal government claims to have over us. Again, I, you know, I've I've said it before. Justice John Marshall says, however extravagant the pretension to to equate an occupied and inhabited territory the discovery of an inhabited ter- a, a, a territory that already has people on it with conquering them to make discovery and conquest the same however extravagant that is if we can get away with doing it if we can say it from the beginning and get away with doing it then we make it our law I mean, think about what these guys have said. And, you know, that's not un- unlike what these arbitration panelists get, did. You know, what, you know what they based their whole ruling on? Well, you paid for 14 years. You, you developed a pattern of paying. You agreed to pay on year one through year 14. So, hell, we're saying you got to pay through another seven years. I mean, it's a, it's a similar argument. It's an extravagant pretension to say, that the Senecas agreed to pay for 21 years because they didn't. They clearly didn't. But this idea of, of massaging language and, and making bad rulings just so they can rule the, the way they want to rule. I mean, law should be like science, right? I mean, you would think law should be like science if you let the evidence demonstrate what is true. Science, I mean, if you're, if you're a scientist and you say, look, well, here's what I want to prove, and I'm going to find all the evidence I can to prove this point down the road. This is, this is the point that I want to prove. That's not science. Science says, no, you gather the evidence and you see where that evidence leads you. That's what law should do, do too. But <laughs> I'll tell you, not only has science been so screwed up by religion and religious taboos, that they they actually had to skew science you know a certain way and you know they had to 
condemn folks like Galileo and, you know, you know, uh, charge him with heresy and all kinds of stuff. I mean, look, that's happened for, for years. And it's still happening. This Graham Hancock, who uh, um, is, is asserting today that, um, uh, that the archaeological evidence is overwhelming, that Native people inhabited the Western Hemisphere for 100,000 years longer than what previous uh, archaeology and anthropology has suggested. He knows that the reason that, that, that has been so hard a lift to get people to admit that is racism. The science is clear. The, sci- the science is very clear. But overcoming the prejudices associated with, I mean, the Bering Strait theory. There's no such thing as a Bering Strait theory. At, at best, it's a weak hypothesis. There's a difference between a hypothesis and a theory. A theory is what you get when you take evidence and, and it gives you, um, uh, based on the evidence, you can make a conclusion. But if you already have a conclusion and then you only, you only consider evidence to fulfill that conven- evidence, then it, then it's then it's only it's a hypothesis and a weak one. See, and that's what happens in law. You've got white men with black robes on who already know how they want to rule, so they're gonna they're gonna say, "Let me rule the way I want to rule. Give me enough, and if you don't give me enough, then then I got to make a bad ruling in your favor." And that's what they did. And that's what the arbitration panels did. Did that's what Justice John Marshall did in eighteen twenty three and in uh, in eighteen eighteen thirty one. And we see it, Judge Arcara here, when it comes to uh, land claims for the, for the Senecas on Grand Island. I mean, we, we see it case after case after case. So does that mean that we should never be in their court? Look, I'm not saying go into the court system. I'm not saying ask the courts to resolve the problem. But when we get dragged in because they're trying to sue us over taxes, or if the Senecas don't pay and the state brings them into federal court, then make your freaking argument. Make them, make them make an absurd ruling. Make them validate an absurd ruling. Make them speak ill like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Make them say something absurd like Paul Gozer. You know, look, we got to call these people out. You know, look, uh, 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 let, me, let me step away from politics for a second. Tiger Woods won the Masters. Hadn't won the Masters in 14 years. And then <laughs> Donald Trump invites Tiger Woods to the White House to give him the, what's it called, the Pre- Presidential Medal of Freedom? I mean, what the hell does winning the Masters do, uh, tournament have to do with freedom? You know what Tiger Woods is? Tiger Woods is a great athlete, a phenomenal athlete, who plays golf. Oh, what a coincidence. Trump plays golf. He also has had this twisted history of screwing around with porn stars and, and strippers. Uh, sound familiar, Donald Trump? Other people who've received this this presidential medal of freedom are people who made contributions to man's um, achievements, not personal achievements. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'll never watch Tiger Woods play golf again. I rooted for him the last uh, uh, the the the, uh, the last Masters. I watched I watched the end of it. I'm thinking, wow, you know what a, what a great story for him. But is is his personal achievement to come back from? All his social ills, his his mental ills, his physical ills, to win the, to win a green jacket at, at, at Augusta, is that something that warrants the the Presidential Medal of Freedom? Well, if if it's based on uh, having sex with porn stars and strippers and playing golf, then then he passed the the Trump test. So he goes to the White House. But what happens w- with the world champion um, Boston Red Sox? Only the white people. Went to Donald. Went to the White House for their cheeseburgers. Only the white people. All of the all the all the black players and all the people of color, except for one Cuban, <laughs> who you know, and we know uh, where the Cubans, uh, you know, uh, how they view the Republicans. But they, uh, it, in fact, <laughs> they they're not calling them the Red Sox anymore. They're calling them the White Sox because it's the White Sox who went to, who went to the White House. Not n- none of the uh, the players of color, but but Tiger Woods th- couldn't understand. He should have declined this this medal because he didn't advance mankind. He didn't do anything that was good for the country or for humanity. 
He won a freaking tournament. Uh, no, he won a bunch of tournaments. Has he been good for golf? Sure he has. But you want to talk about another conflict of interest. I mean, he, he actually has had business with Donald Trump. So Donald Trump gives him the... I mean, to me, again, when I say we need to, we need to call these people out, we need to expose these people, we need to see who are the racists. So when, when Paul Deister, the mayor of Niagara Falls, gives a speech at a 9-11 commemoration and compares the... Um, the 19th century cavalry who massacred native people with the first responders in New York. That's racist folks. But I heard, I, I didn't hear anybody say anything. I think I was the only voice. I actually went to the Niagara Falls city council meeting. And even those Republicans sitting on that city council, and I says, look, you need to condemn what, uh, what your mayor did. And I'm telling you, you need to pass a resolution condemning his, uh, his, uh, Yes, he's rep- he represented this city, and he compared massacring uh, U.S. cavalry with uh, with first responders. And you you guys should should, con- uh, should pass a resolution condemning his speech. Not a one of them did it. Not no, none of the Democrats, none of the Republicans. They don't they don't do that stuff. No. Why? Because racism isn't a right thing or a left thing. It's a white thing. Well, there's a black guy in the city council too. He didn't do a goddamn thing either. Why? Because that's the way the system works. But we need to call them all out for it. When, when Andrew Cuomo says a racist comment, well, Senecas have a history of breaking deals. What did you say? Did you say the Senecas have a history of breaking agreements? H- have you not read any his- U.S. history? Uh, in the history of the United States, New York State, and everybody else who's, who's violated treaty after treaty after treaty, who's, who's done everything possible to subjugate Native people? beneath you and you want to sit there and, and make a public statement that the Senecas have a history of breaking agreements? You gotta be freaking kidding me. You know what that is? It's racist. So we need to call them all out. But you know what we won't? We we don't. And and, and if I've got any frustration, look, I'm glad that a few people will like a comment that I that I'll post on Facebook or they'll share it or whatever else. But man, I'm trying to get a conversation started. I want people to have these conversations. I want people to step up. I'll still do it if I'm. I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll. I'll do it alone in the woods if I have to. But man, we we need we need to we need to fight the fight because it's right. Not because we're necessarily going to win. Not because we'll stop the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Northern Access Pipeline. Look, we'll we'll get our wins along the way. We'll we'll knock a few down. But we're not going to win everyone. I went to prison for 2 years. I I lost. But you know what? I didn't come out with my tail between my legs. I came out fighting still. And so shame on the rest of you who've never had to sacrifice. Who just think it's too much of an inconvenience. Because we all can do something. And part of that something might be confronting, your, you know, the guy you work with. Say, so, you know, that's, re- that's really wrong. That's kind of that's racist what you just said. I mean, Bill, what, what Bill Maher, he, he, for all of Donald Trump mocking uh, Elizabeth Warren by calling her Pocahontas. So what does Bill Maher do? Because he's such a freaking comic genius. So you look at uh, Trump's uh, financial uh, history and... They sh- uh, they should call him Pocahontas. Oh, so you're gonna so you're gonna mock Pocahontas in a different way, and you think it's right because what you're you're cute? You gotta be freaking kidding me! Oh no, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, you you do a song politi- or do a show called Politically Incorrect. <laughs> Jesus, oh, it's amazing, it's amazing. But you know, this is this is it's why we gotta call them all out. I don't care if they're if they're if they're a liberal comedian. Or, or, or a, um, a conservative evangelical. We need to call them all out, folks. But, you know, and it's on us to do this. It's on us to do it. Look, I, I, was, I was proud of those, of those players who refused to go to the White House. Black players who said, no, I'm not going there. The guy's a racist. I was proud to see that 
I mean, it would have been great to see the white players of the, on the Boston Red Sox say, no, I'm not going unless the whole team's going. And you know what? Tiger Woods, you, uh, you know, you lost a fan. You know, and not that it matters. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not that much into that whole sports fanaticism anyway. But, you know, what, what a weakness. What a weakness that gets demonstrated by these people. So whether it's Bill Maher or Tiger Woods or anybody else, um, we need to see where they stand on this stuff. We need to know what they're, how they really view us because if we ever get ourselves in a situation where we're depending on, on one of these guys as a voice for us, we damn sure better be, uh, understand how they really view us or how they really view politics or how they really view... Uh, look, if you are okay with Trump, you may not be a racist. But you're okay with racism. You may not be somebody who sleeps with the uh, porn stars and strippers, but you're okay with somebody who does. You may be not be somebody who cheats on your wife, but you're okay with somebody who does. You may not be a sexist, but you're okay with somebody who who is. And you know what? If you're okay with it, any of those things. You probably are a little of those things. And that's why we need to call it out, folks. All right. So just remember, we fight because it's right, not because we're, not because it's, it's, it's an easy win, not because we, we're sure of victory. We fight because it's right. It's John Kane, this Let's Talk Native. We'll see you in a few days. Yahweh. Anyway.